Hi, my name is Cecilia Puna. Welcome to this episode of Brave New Women. All around the world, there are amazing, ordinary women doing extraordinary things. Brave New Women is about giving those women a platform and a voice. And it's about changing the way that women are perceived. And it's a way of inspiring all of us to do the things that we've always wanted to do. Today, I'm so pleased to be talking to Emily Cohen. And Emily runs a small community radio station in the state of Wyoming, which is called Jackson Hole Community Radio. And she's also the director and producer of a project about the song Little Lies Jane. So the song came from, it, it arose from American slavery and it became David Bowie's first single. And it's been sung by black and white musicians through the ages. And it is perhaps the most recorded folk tune in America. Emily was described to me as the most interesting woman in the world, which is a fairly (laughs) huge uh, label to bear. So I don't expect you to to be trying to live up to that label, but it it certainly whetted my appetite to, to speak to you and to interview. So welcome, Emily. Thanks for having me today. Emily, could you just tell us a little bit about your background, where you grew up, your education, where you live? Sure. Yeah, I actually, I'm from Washington, D.C. and grew up just outside in the Maryland suburbs and uh, went to undergraduate in Wisconsin at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And then after that, I spent a fair amount of time on the U.S.-Mexico border and taught uh, second grade with a program called Teach for America that places recent college grads um, in high needs public schools. And so I was in a place called Edinburgh, Texas, and it was kind of a no man's land, Um, not necessarily the U.S. and not necessarily Mexico, somewhere in between, even though it was technically in the United States. uh, And that experience really opened my eyes to a different side of the American experience. Um, What was your initial training in? It was really short. Um, it was a one summer, uh, a five week intensive period. Um, and then over the two year period that I did this program, they provided a lot of support um, and instruction. But the idea is that it, we need to be attracting um, a different kind of candidate to the education profession. Um, and so they were attracting sort of high, so called high achievers um, to public schools. Um, to drive change. And um, it's been around for at least two decades now. And it's it's a controversial program. Um, as you can imagine, like that premise is, is kind of loaded, um, but it is effective in, in many ways. And it has also added a lot of people and talent to the pipeline, whether that's as actual teachers in the classroom or people in the public policy field advocating for education. So you say you were teaching um, on the U.S.-Mexico border um, and you say it was a bit of a no-man's land. So who who were you actually teaching? Tell me, tell me a bit about the context around that. So the, the students were Mexican-American or Mexican. Um, we, we don't ask immigration status. Um, but this community was quite poor, Um a lot of the families lived in neighborhoods called colonias, which are kind of like shanty towns that are with trailers. A lot of times they don't have running water or electricity, um, but they're coming to the U.S. often as migrant laborers um, working in the agricultural sector. Um, the Rio Grande Valley, where this is, is or historically was largely citrus groves and and other agriculture. It's changing a lot. Um, When I was there, it was the fourth fastest growing region in the country. Um, And so there were these shanty towns that would pop up. um, And then the communities, the towns would have to provide education. And so they were building like four new schools on average a year in the school district where I was, just to keep up with this population growth. So it a lot of the families were recent immigrants, but some had been there for a generation or two. And you were teaching um, primary school 
Um, primary school, second grade. So seven and eight year olds. And what was your, what was your motivation to do that? Why did you want to go and teach there? Yeah, I, I wanted to have an impact. I had always been interested in uh, international policy and development and always thought I might join the foreign service. But when I found out about Teach for America, it seemed like, you know what? We have problems in our own country. I should be addressing um, and contributing to my own community, even though that wasn't exactly the community I was from. Um, but it, I also spoke Spanish. And so I wanted to be in a community where I could practice my Spanish. And it it was an adventure. I, mean, I was in my early 20s and uh, it was a way to give back and have an impact. And it certainly propelled me in a whole new direction than I ever thought I would go. And what direction was that? Well, after that, I worked for seven years in public policy um, and spearheaded a project at a think tank that looked at labor policy in school districts around the country. And this was at a time when there was a lot of focus on teacher labor unions um, and the role of labor unions in shaping education. And so the project looked at these contracts between school districts and the labor unions to see how they were shaping the hiring and firing and evaluation policies of teachers. Um, and it was kind of ground, groundbreaking at the time. Um, there was a period when there was a lot of focus on small class sizes and small schools. The Gates Foundation had put a lot of money towards that. And actually, this project that I worked on was the first that they it, they funded um, that was looking at human capital. So looking at actually the pipeline of people that are working in education and that this project actually shifted their whole funding strategy in education to look at maybe it's not just the number of um, people in a classroom, but who's leading the classroom? How can we attract the right people to the profession um, to increase student achievement? And how did they, what, what was, what were the conclusions of that? How do you attract the right people? Um, well, it's complicated, but making there's a couple sides to it. So it's not just the labor contracts, but it's also looking at who who is being attracted into schools of education and graduating with education degrees. Um, so the organization is called the National Council on Teacher Quality, and they looked at the average SAT scores of various majors. And unfortunately, in this country, education majors are not necessarily the top of the class. Um, more often, um, not as high achiever, high of achievers. Um, and so part of it is increasing the standards for what it means to become a teacher in the first place um, and making it more prestigious. But again, to make it more prestigious, you also have to offer more pay. Um, you have to be able to recognize people's accomplishments, whether that's not, in a, you know, it could be merit pay, bonuses, um, but opportunities for advancement. Those are things that exist in other professions. Um, people are motivated by recognition. Um, and a lot of times in, in teaching, it's kind of thankless. Um, mm -hmm. And people go into it for selfless reasons. And that's fantastic. But if we're really going to want to attract the best and the brightest, we might need to rethink some of that model. Mm -hmm. I think that's a problem. Um across the world in fact is how do you how do you attract really good teachers and how do you pay them you know, right <laughs> yeah it's it, it a lot of places done. are struggling with it um, yeah. yeah and there there's better models and worse models um, out there but um it's, mm. it's a it feels like an intractable problem in this country because that was you know a long time ago that i was working on those issues um now almost more than a decade ago, um, and I think we're still struggling with this, and we haven't quite seemed to get it right. I heard someone from the Gates Foundation speaking recently, and they said that um, the Gates Foundation has made a huge impact on um, on children in third non developing countries being vaccinated, and oh, that the, their impact on education in the U.S. has been almost none, <laughs> despite mm -hmm. the despite the amount of money being, investment. being investment yeah. yeah yeah and you know some problems are so much more complex you know vaccination well it's complex in its own way but it's 
um, it's in and out one shot. You're, you're good or two. Um, whereas education is a process um, mm. and the amount of investment is, is much greater. Mm. So let's fast forward from there to where you are now. Um, what, what, how was that decade spent between when you're working on public policy and teaching and, and the uh, radio station? Yeah, so I, um, after teaching, I worked uh, in city planning, actually, um, worked just outside of Washington, D.C., and did everything from public art programs to park development, um, creating playgrounds and dog parks, um, everything in between as well. Um, and I went back to school, actually, for ecological design, uh, which is kind of like landscape architecture, but from a broader scale. So looking at um, how do we design our communities, our towns, so that they are more environmentally friendly. Um, And I was really interested in green infrastructure and green streets. And I actually didn't stay in that field. Um, I, I, shortly after graduating, I got a degree, or after my degree, I moved to Jackson, Wyoming for a a planning job here. Um, And it's a, I was drawn to it because this is the gateway to two of America's most iconic national parks, Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Park. And Jackson is known for having really uh, strong land development protections. And so you even just driving around, walking around the community, it does feel different. And part of the reason is those regulations that protect the feel of a place. We don't have billboards. We don't have big signs. Things are built at a human scale. Where development is, is largely concentrated for the most part in in town. Um, Whereas in many places in the United States, that's not the case. There's sprawl. There's a giant McDonald's sign. There's billboards. There's lights that beam up at night um, so you can't see the stars. This is a place where that those there's protections to ensure that people can still um, experience the natural world in, in the way that we may have 50, 75 years ago. But there's also consequences to that because it's a very expensive place to live. Building is hard. There's a housing crisis as a result. Um, but I was drawn to this place because I had this environmental ethos and um, wanted to to kind of understand a community that had maybe figured some of this out. And are you still working in planning? I'm not. And then, so after um, about a year and a half there, I I took the job at the radio station. I was a volunteer DJ um, and always had a love for music and um, am a fiddle player myself, had moved to Tennessee when I turned 30 briefly for about four months to study fiddle. And after that, I worked at Smithsonian Folkways briefly as um, just doing marketing and other projects for them. It's the, basically the nonprofit record label of the Smithsonian um, Institution. And so I always had this love for music and, and tried my hand at being a radio DJ. And just a few months after that, uh, this opportunity arose and I became the executive director of the radio station. I had really no background in radio, but I had a background, like I said, in community development and the arts in some way. Um, and so I've kind of just had to figure it out as I go along (laughs) and it's been a fun challenge. Now, what are the, what have been, what have been, what have been the challenges in, um, in, in running a radio? Well, I think one of the biggest challenges is figuring out the role of media in this day and age. Um, Media is so, and journalism, news is so essential to democracy, and it's really threatened in this country. In Jackson, there is only one newspaper, and there is really no other radio news. Um, We do have a state NPR, National Public Radio, um, affiliate, but they don't have a reporter here. Um, And so we see an opportunity to fill a gap in information. Um, and especially when people are so polarized, local news is kind of one of the ways that some experts say that we can combat some of that polarization because it's, it's local, you understand it, you trust the people that are covering these issues. 
So that's been the biggest challenge is how do we build this newsroom? When I took over, it was a part-time, we had a part-time news director. Um, Now we have a full-time news director and a full-time reporter and a handful of freelancers. Um, And so there's this opportunity and we don't really know where it's going to go, but, um, but it's important. And, um, and I think our community is recognizing that. And what sort of, um, what sort of issues do you cover? Do you cover very local issues? Do you cover national issues? Do you cover international issues? We cover local and regional, um, but we do have, um, we do air a few national programs. Um, but in terms of our actual newsroom, we're covering issues around housing, affordable housing, which is a terrible crisis here. People who work here can't afford to live here. Um, we cover environmental issues. We cover climate change in the West. Right now, I haven't been able to see the blue sky in like a month because it's been so smoky. We have this fire in Oregon and throughout Idaho, and the smoke is just blanketing the sky. It's it's quite apocalyptic. Um, so we're covering issues that are affecting people here. Water, um, we're in a severe drought. Um, and then we're also partnering with other radio stations throughout the Rocky Mountain region to cover issues around, also around affordable housing, because we're not the only community um, that's facing this challenge. Um, we're covering the fossil fuel industry um, and efforts to transition out of fossil fuels into other forms of energy. Wyoming is a one of the main, the main industry here is energy, um, but it's heavily reliant on fossil fuels. Um, so one of the things that we put a lot of effort into is solutions journalism. So not just reporting on the problem, but looking at solutions out there and, and amplifying those. So that's the that's the radio. Um, tell me about the Little Liza Jane project. Oh, the Little Liza Jane project is so dear to my heart. That is, uh, that's been a project I've been working on for a few years. It's a documentary film podcast and probably a book at this point. Um, it's evolved into these many iterations as we've just learn more. There's so much material that we have that it's impossible to fit all into it all into one medium. Um, but Little Liza Jane is perhaps the most recorded folk tune in the American popular canon. And it's a song that a lot of people might know in their subconscious. It's something you may have learned when you were in elementary school, or you may have heard Nina Simone's version, but you don't necessarily have it at the tip of your fingertips or top of your brain, but it's in you. Can you sing us a couple of bars? Uh, oh, I'm a terrible singer, but, um, oh, little Liza, little Liza Jane, I know a girl in Baltimore, little Liza Jane, streetcar running by my door, little Liza Jane. So, <laughs> but you can cut that from the podcast. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's, and there's the amazing thing about the tune is there's many versions, there's many lyrics, um, and there's kind of two, two families, um, within this tune. There's the Little Liza Jane version, which is largely sung by African Americans and has more roots in, um, blues and jazz. And then there's this version called Goodbye Liza Jane. That's more of an Appalachian or country version that was, more you know some by whites but that's those are generalizations and there's so much crossover and that's the amazing thing with this tune is it's passed back and forth between black and white musicians since the 1800s i mean maybe before we don't really know the earliest records we've been able to find are around 1863 1864 um during the civil war that referenced this tune there's civil war regiments that and and accounts um of Civil War regiments, rather, that reference this tune. There's um, slave ex-slave narratives from the Works Progress Administration, which was a program during the New Deal in the 1930s that brought writers to record um, and document the lives of um, everyday Americans. Um, but one of the efforts that they they pursued was documenting the lives of former slaves um, or former enslaved people. Um, and we found about nine or 10 of these narratives that reference this song. Now, if you go back to your life and you think, you know, you're telling your story, is there a song that would be part of your narrative? I don't know if there would be a song that would be part of mine. 
that I would just bring up. But somehow little Liza Jane played that role for people. Um, and so this project is is telling that story. Um, and it's it's evolved and, in, in, you know, we had thought of it as originally just a single feature length film. But right now we're, we're actually turning it more into a docu-series, um, visiting five locations iconic to the song's history. Um, and really diving deep into each of those locations and using that as a springboard to explore the various topics um, like that this song touched upon. For example, um, there's a fiddler named Fiddling John Carson, and he performed a version of Little Liza Jane, but he was also um, in the KKK, and he performed at fiddler conventions. Um, and one of his songs was the Ballad of Mary Fagan, which was a very anti-Semitic song and, but popularized him. This was in the the twenties, um, popularized him. It was a ballad that was sung about a girl that was murdered at a factory in the South and in Atlanta, I believe. And, um, a Jewish man was accused of the murder, falsely accused of the murder, but he was hung. It was kind of like the U.S.'s Dreyfus affair. Um, and, you know, here's this man. He's performing Little Liza Jane, or Goodbye Liza Jane, rather. Um, and so we're going to go to his grave. Every year, fiddlers gather at his grave and perform um, and play together. And, you know, there's a lot of wonderful things to celebrate in the music that he created, but there's also a lot of really dark things um, and that we should be talking about the complexities of. Um, so contrasting his life with, say, somebody like a man named Scott Dunbar, who performed this song and grew up and lived his whole life um, in southern you know, Mississippi um, and is the, the son of a former enslaved man. Um, and so contrasting those experiences, and they are all part of the American experience. So we can't ignore any of them, even if they're dark and disturbing. And it's a way for us to maybe find our commonalities. And you know, maybe this is a song that we can all hum once again. And so in a way, it's, um, it's a song that is almost a reflection of American history and of exactly. different, di- different parts of American history. Mm-hmm. It, it really touches on every facet of American history, from um, pre-Civil War times to minstrelsy to um, the New Deal in the 1930s, um, the advent of radio and the popularization of so-called popular culture. Um, this song was um, on Harry Belafonte's uh, special. He started a TV show and he they performed Little Liza Jane during this one one time special which was canceled because he insisted on having a mixed race audience or you know back in the day they would have like a live audience and people would be dancing and um it, but the network didn't want to have this mixed race audience um and so the show was canceled but during that one episode Little Liza Jane was featured. So it's been everywhere. Mm. <laughs> but maybe not as much in the 21st century. But it's a story in, in, in a pretty divided time that maybe we need to hear in the 21st century. Mm. And was there actually a Little Liza Jane? Was there, was there a person? Uh, <laughs> we don't know. That's the, that's the biggest mystery. We want to find that person. But it's, you know, it was a common name at the time. Um, And who little Liza Jane is, is also kind of a funny thing. She's this strong, independent woman. She refuses to uh, marry. She wants to be her own woman. Um, So we haven't really been able to figure out who this, you know, is it really based on somebody or is it just an archetype? archetype? Um, But we do ask that question of all the participants in the film. Who do you think Liza Jane is? Um, and everybody has their own spin on it, but you know, she's strong. She's a sassy lady is essentially the gist of it. And, you know, in this era, you know, it kind of applies to your podcast too. Um, she could, she's kind of the embodiment of, uh, this brave new woman. Hmm. Was she, was she a slave? 
in the song? It's possible. Um, no, in the song, she wasn't a slave, um, but she, you know, could have been. This is a song where, like, the man is often, it's often sung by men trying to get this woman, little Eliza Jane, to marry him. And, um, but she could have been, but that wasn't central to her persona. It, what was central was her independence um, and her sass. And so she's uh, she's asking him to marry him. She's she's saying no. Is she? Yep, she's saying no. She she mm. wants her independence. Mm. Which in the I mean in the nineteenth century that's pretty unusual. Yeah, and mm. and maybe that was a reflection also of um, the dynamics between blacks and whites. You know, I know I want my independence. Um, let me be. Or mm. some theorize that it was. Black men imitating the world of white men, um, or it was children imitating the world of adults, because um, often it was also a children's game song. Um, mm. So there's so many versions of it. There's um, there's versions that are stealing partner dances, um, where you would take one partner and swap it out for another. Um, so it's it's it, it's an imitation, perhaps, of. Um, broader society encapsulated in very simple lyrics in a in a fun song how did you what how and why did you first start getting interested in the song well i learned the song on the fiddle it was one of the first songs i learned um when i was learning how to play mostly appalachian old-time music and didn't think much of it then um but a few years ago, a friend of mine uh, wrote a blog post. It's kind of like the, they, they call him the Alan Lomax of the internet. Alan Lomax was a musicologist who documented um, the musical vernacular of, of everyday people um, throughout the world. But, but a lot of it was in the American South. Um, and a, a lot of his collection is now part of the Smithsonian, but he also has his own collection housed elsewhere. Um, and so a friend of mine had, had discovered this song and wrote a blog post about Little Liza Jane, largely through the jazz and blues tradition. And I read this post and we had kind of lost contact over the years, um, but had collaborated on creative projects before. Um, so I read his post and I followed up with an email and I said, I know this song, but I know it from a totally different side. Um, and so we started talking and we started doing more research and suddenly we started discovering dozens and then hundreds of versions of this song by all of the most iconic musicians from the 20th century. Everyone from Lead Belly to Pete Seeger, Dwayne Eddy. Um, I mean, the list is long. Nina Simone, as you mentioned, David Bowie. It was David Bowie's first single. How crazy is that? Um, and later he, he reflects on this, um, you know, in the early 2000s, there's a concert of him kind of poking fun at his early days and poking fun at the song. And it is kind of a silly song, but the fact is so many people have been captivated by this song and have put their own spin on it. And that is noteworthy and that should be recognized, um, you know, so many people from so many different genres of music are finding inspiration of, in this song. Maybe in these like very divided times that we're living in, we can also find some inspiration in this song and find some points of hope and points of commonality. Mm -hmm. And so it's you and your friend who are, who are behind the project or is there a whole team of you? Now there's, it's slowly evolving into a team of people. So it's my friend, Dan Gutstein. He's my co-producer and co-director. Um, and he's a writer um, and is also in a band called Joy on Fire, um, but is a published author, largely poetry, but um, of other books as well. Um, and then we have Erish Roland, who's a filmmaker. He's done, he named me Malala, The Final Year. Um, he was on the Jonestown Flood. Um, Driving Miss Daisy, very accomplished, very, very accomplished cinematographer. Um, and then we have an editor, Katie Sheridan, and another uh, second camera and editor, Allison Sperry. So we have a team of, um, of people working on the project. It's mostly Dan and I spearheading all the research and the organization. Um, and then we have a amazing cohort 
constellation really of scholars and experts who have already done interviews with us and have weighed in and are helping to shape our understanding um, and knowing what questions to ask and guiding us in this journey. Um, and so that's everybody from uh, former the former chair of the National Endowment from, of the Humanities, Bill Ferris, to um, musicians like Dom Flemons, who is a American folk musician who produced an album called Black Cowboys. So exploring, he's black, but exploring um, the cowboy music of African-Americans, which is something we often don't think about. We think that, oh, cowboys were just these white guys riding in the West and terrorizing the native populations, but it's, it's more complex than that. So we have a, we have a pretty impressive group of people involved as well. And when, when do you think the film will be, um, will be finished, will be coming out? Well, the film be, and the book and the, the podcast. Yeah, all the podcast. Um, we're working on the podcast now. Um, and so that will hopefully be out this winter. And then the film, we're hope, we were hoping to film. We should have been filming already, but the pandemic put a hold on all that. So we're hoping this winter or spring, um, spring of 2022, we can actually start traveling again and um, do, do so safely. Um, so, but from that point, it could be, you know, a year or two out from when it's actually ready. We do have trailers on our website, um, for both the film and the podcast. If people want to get a little taste of what this is going to be about. And that's just at LizaJaneMovie.com. Mm. And how has the project working on Little Liza Jane, how's that changed you? <sighs> I think it's taught me patience and knowing that um, one needs to have an open mind. You can't hold fast to an idea. It's been really challenging to raise money for this project. We believe in it so deeply, but there's a lot of really great projects out there in the world. Um, and so it's been hard to, to know, okay, well, if this approach isn't working, we need to find another approach. And just to be patient with that, to be open to other ideas of how to approach something, um, to not be so precious with ideas um, and to know, okay, a lot of times I've jumped around from project to project. I'm into lots of things. I love playing music. I love drawing. I love all these. I have a lot of interests, but if you really want, if, if you really believe in something and you really want it to work, sometimes that you need patience. Um, and so this has been, you know, three, four years in the making and it's still not done, but it's a much better conceived and project now in 2021 than it was in 2019. Um, we have more people involved. Um, the structure of the film has evolved. Um, and so just knowing, trusting that and, and holding true to your original inspiration, but being open to evolution. Mm -hmm. Just as we start to wind this up, there are two questions I usually ask at the end of each podcast. The first one is um, the fact that you are a woman in your career. Has that been a positive, a negative, neutral? What do you feel about being a It's a complex question because I think it's not just about being a woman, but I'm a single woman. Um, I'm actually divorced. And um, I think having that, being a woman and having freedom as a single woman is, it has enabled me to pursue all these things. But at the same time, I see friends that are married and they have security, you know, this is an expensive country, it's an expensive place to live. Having that partnership or a marriage provides stability and maybe a sense of comfort that you don't always have if you're single. So being single, I feel I, I have to be driven. I have to be doing something because or else what am I doing with my time? Sometimes I look at other people's lives and if they're married or partner, I mean, I have a partner, but we don't, you know, we're, it's not a for, you know, who knows if it's a forever partnership. Um, but it provides like a sense of security or stability that maybe tempers drive. And sometimes I think because I am single and 
I, I have this motivation because I want to have an impact because I'm not necessarily going to have that in my home life. And it's, it's a pro and a, a con. Like I would love to have that, but um, that home life and family, but that might not be in the cards for me. And so I think as a result, um, I'm driven in a way that is somewhat unusual among people that I see. Mm. So I'm hearing that there's a wish for stability, but there is also the fact that that's given you opportunities that you wouldn't have had if you were having to deal with school lunches and exactly yeah and and the dog and (laughs) yep all those things yeah yeah and the last thing I wanted to ask you Emily is um if you had a message for the people who are listening or if there's anything that we haven't covered that you'd like to cover anything at all that you'd like to say to to finish up I would say to just try things um if you're curious about something, try it. If you have an idea, give it a go. You're never going to know. You can't think your way into a solution to a problem. You just have to try it. Um, and so that would be my advice is test the waters on an idea, on an interest, on a hobby, on a job. Um, and that's the way that we grow and we learn best from our own mistakes. And so just to to jump right in. Mm. Well, I'm glad that you've jumped into so many different projects. It was um, absolutely fantastic. And I really look forward to seeing the film when it comes out and hearing the podcast and reading the book. Yeah. And um, the thing that strikes me about your message is that a lot of the women on the podcast, their message is find yourself, whereas I think your message is slightly different, which is in order to find yourself, you need to just start and just try different things. And that unless you try different things, you won't ever find what really motivates you and what you really love. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if there's like a true self for me. I'm interested in a lot of things and I could probably be happy doing many things. I have, I've done many things. Um, And so people always will say like, find your passion. Well, the only way to find that is by trying things out. Mm -hmm. It's been a it's been just been a delight to spend time with you, Emily. So thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you for the to me. It's been great. Yeah, thank you. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Brave New Women. Certain podcast sites such as Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, or Podchaser let you leave a rating and a review. The more ratings and reviews we get, the more people will listen, and the more these women's stories will be shared. So I'd really appreciate it if you could. Thanks for listening.